Welcome to the Wednesday evening Alcoholism Drug Addiction Education Program, sponsored by the Colmac Clinic, the Shepherd Pratt Hospital, and the Maryland Chapter of the National Council for Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Tonight, I almost want, don't want to tell you the title of the lecture, because the minute I say we're going to talk about addiction, what a lot of people think is, oh, I know what that is. That's when, you, that's when you get the shakes, right? You try to, you're drinking too much and you get the shakes and, and, and then you're addicted. Well, no, no, that, that's physical dependence. And physical dependence is not addiction. Many addicts, not many, but there are a, a, a group of addicts who also become physically dependent. But you're an addict, perhaps even before you're physically dependent. So you have to keep those two separate. They're not the same. Right? Lots of people have this notion that addiction involves, quote, hard drugs uh, and injection of hard drugs till you reach the point where you become physically dependent. And that's, that's an extreme case. It's not the garden variety case. There are plenty of alcoholics uh, who are sober today who are never physically dependent on alcohol. They didn't have to be withdrawn from alcohol, but they satisfy all the criteria for what the DSM-5 now says is psychoactive substance uh, dependence. So we have to, first thing we usually have to do uh, when we, we talk about this addiction stuff is that we have to um, deal with the myths that often accompany it. So. One of the first myths is that um, alcohol is physical dependence, what I just mentioned. That it's not until you get the shakes, uh, or if you're using a stimulant drug, you crash. That's how so you know someone's in withdrawal. They've used a, a downer drug, and they stop it abruptly, and their nervous system is agitated. Their temperature, blood pressure, pulse rate rises. They sweat and shake. If you're using a stimulant drug, the withdrawal reaction is in the opposite direction of the drug. So downers overstimulate it, uppers uh, a crash. Okay? Um, that's physical dependence, but that's not addiction. Addiction is different from that. In fact, uh, more often than not, someone is addicted before he becomes dependent, and there are some who never become uh, dependent. All right. uh, suppose for a moment we said that addiction is a problem which happens whenever a drug in a relatively short period of time will cause life-threatening physical dependence. If you pretend that's true, that whenever a drug in a short period of time causes life-threatening dependence, the first drug that you can't call addictive uh, is heroin. You've just created a definition of addiction that won't allow you to think of heroin as an addictive substance. And I think, I think we want to include heroin, okay? Why? Well, heroin dependence does happen rapidly. If you're given enough uh, heroin even within 30 days, you will become physically dependent on heroin, no matter who you are. All right? Everyone who uses heroin at a high enough dose, even in 30 days, becomes physically dependent. And if you try to stop it abruptly, you will have to, you will withdraw. But withdrawal from heroin is never life-threatening. You can't die from heroin withdrawal. You can die while you're in heroin withdrawal, but not from it. You're, you're in withdrawal from heroin and you're out of it, and you walk across the street, and a car hits you, you're dead. But it's not from the withdrawal. It's from an accident that happened while you were withdrawing. You're in withdrawal from heroin, and you shoot up again. Unfortunately, what you shoot up is a dose that is way past your usual limit, and the overdose kills you. You're dead, uh, but it's not withdrawing from heroin. It's overdosing from heroin, which kills you. You don't pay your dealer and he shoots you and you're dead. <laughs> but that's not withdrawal killing you. That's, uh, 
That's another reason that's calling you. So it's universal, it happens rapidly, but it's never life-threatening. Alcohol withdrawal is, alcohol withdrawal is um, person-specific. It's, it's not universal. Uh, there are two people who will drink as much alcohol for as many years. Uh, they'll come into treatment. One will be physically dependent, the other won't. They drink the same amount for the same period of time. One is physically dependent and the other is not. Alcohol is selectively dependence forming. Selectively dependence forming. Okay? So it doesn't happen to everybody. Even two people who drink the same amount of booze. It won't happen to all of them. All right? So it, it doesn't happen quickly either. I mean, people drink for years before they become physically dependent on alcohol, and some never do. All right? But this time, it's potentially fatal. It can kill you. All right? Doesn't happen often, but a portion of the alcoholic population will go into DTs. That portion that go into DTs from 3 to 15 percent will die from DTs. All right? So it's potentially fatal. But it doesn't happen universally. It happens selectively. And it doesn't happen rapidly. Sometimes it takes years before you become physically dependent on alcohol. And again, as I said, uh, not everyone does. So uh, you see, uh, I see all, at least, I saw all the time uh, patients who were physically dependent, um, but they weren't addicts. They weren't addicts. You see some uh, anxiety patients who were put on a benzodiazepine, a Valium, Librium, Cerex, Transine, etc. They become physically dependent on it, but they've used the drug exactly as they were prescribed. They just used it too long. So when they try to stop, they go into withdrawal. But when you talk to them and you try to tease out whether they have the characteristics of addiction, I know they're physically dependent, you find not all of them, all, not all of them are. Some of them have used a drug exactly as it was prescribed and exactly the way it was prescribed and exactly the amount that it was prescribed and yet they are physically dependent, but they don't talk like addicts. They don't think like addicts. I had one patient say to me, I can't wait to get off this drug. I said, why? He said, it's making me groggy and, I, and feeling stupid, and I don't want to be anymore. All right? He was given the drug because he had problems with uncontrollable vomiting. Of course, they sent him here because we're a psych place, all right? So we would know how to do addiction along with a psychosomatic reaction. Um, after the, w end, the end of the first or middle of the second week, he asked me to speed it up. I said, well, I can't speed it up. The doctors are going to do that. But I'll tell them you want to speed it up. Uh, heroin addicts don't talk that way. Narcotics addicts don't talk that way. They say, give me 80, meaning give me 80 milligrams of um, methadone or I'm leaving treatment. And they'll say, slow it down, <laughs> not speed it up. Whoa, whoa, too hard. The second is that it's not, that addiction is not psychological dependent. So people think that if what you're saying is that it isn't physically dependent, it must be all in your mind. Well, no, this addiction, proneness to addiction, uh, is not all in your mind. Addiction happens to people who are wonderful, good, obedient, nice, mainstream, etc., etc., etc. Okay? You don't choose your brain chemistry. You don't reason to your brain chemistry. And here's one of the features of addiction. Tolerance. Can you cause yourself by an act of your mind or will, can you cause yourself to become tolerant? <coughs> Sorry, it won't work. <laughs> it won't work. Um, the other feature of this addiction stuff is that um, we know of people who have been tolerant from the very outset of their use of the drug. So they didn't make themselves tolerant. They came that way. How many of you know such people? How many of you knew someone in high school, usually happens then, who could really hold his booze? Show of hands? Yeah. 
We all know people like that, right? They didn't develop tolerance. They seem to have come that way. All right? And not many, in fact, I have yet to hear uh, an addict, drug addict, alcoholic, same thing. I have yet to hear one say, uh, I tried to become tolerant. <laughs> you know, I worked hard at it. Drank a pint, threw it up. But God damn it, I'm going to master that pint. And I kept eating wheat, German, exercising. <laughs> you know what they'll tell you? One, I, always, I was always tolerant. And two, I don't know when it happened. In fact, the myth that Dr. Milam dispels in his book is this one. It's not heavy drinking that causes tolerance. It's tolerance that causes heavy drinking. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense. Uh, that if you have tolerance, in order to feel the effect of the drug, what do you have to do? You have to up the ante. So, in fact, if you have tolerance, you, you have to drink more, or else you may as well switch to Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, whichever is your, your preference, because you're not getting that we. So, and we all respond to the same drug differently. Uh, there are some people who are prone to excessive drinking. They have tolerance, and that's a proneness factor. They love the drug, and that's not a decision. Two people drink, one has the one drink feels good, two feels better, three feels dizzy, groggy, sleepy, sick. How many people have I just described in this room? If you have more than two or three, you start feeling dizzy, groggy, sleepy, sick. That's, that's the brain's response to poison protecting you against excessive use. It's saying this is a toxin. That's what alcohol is. This is a toxin. If you drink more of it than two or three drinks, I'm going to make you feel poison. So you get dizzy, groggy, sleepy, sick. Are you then likely to keep drinking? No. Your brain's saying, stop, dummy. <laughs> All right? Stop. Don't keep doing this. I'll make you more poison. There are other people who have one drink that feels good, two feels better, and three feels magnificent, and four feels out of this world, and five feels spec goddamn-tacular, right? And six and seven, you want a phone to call the president, and eight, you want us to get us out of Afghanistan or get us in, whichever your political persuasion. Powerful. That's not a decision. That's re the brain's response to a drug. Any, anyone in this audience have a problem when they use um, amoxicillin or any of the, the uh, uh, pe old penicillins. Anybody have trouble? Anybody? Maybe we've done this. You said you got swelling of the tongue. Swelling of the tongue. So there's proneness and protection to a drug, and it's not all in your mind. All right? It's in your brain's response to the drug. Here's another one that uh, addiction is somehow drug specific. In other words, there are alcoholics who want to believe that they are addicted to Bud Light. And that's all. <laughs> uh, and so they think they can drink other things. Or they're only addicted to whiskey. And they think they can drink Bud Light. Um, I, I wish I had a nickel for every time uh, in the earlier days an alcoholic said to me, can I smoke pot? And I ask them, have you ever smoked pot? No. Why do you want to start now? Oh, I thought I could do something. And I said, well, that's your problem. <laughs> that's your problem, is that you pursue mood-altering drugs because they work for you. They work for you. They make you feel good. And some people, they make you feel good, and other people, they make you feel good. And that's not in your mind, all right? And it's not in one drug as opposed to another drug. If you have an addiction to one drug, the advice, the best advice you'll ever hear is abstain from mood-altering drugs. All of them, all of them, all of them. So you switch to marijuana, and then you start liking marijuana, you start loving marijuana, and then you end up with an addiction to marijuana. And yes, that's possible. Marijuana is an addictive drug. The DSM-5 recently um, in fact, not only lists it as, as such, but also um, 
acknowledges a, a marijuana withdrawal syndrome. Now, I don't know if that's measurable, but at least the DSM now lists it. So, every addict has a drug of choice. So if you put an addict in, in a ta at a table where every drug known to God and man is on the table, an alcoholic will choose alcohol. If you take that all away, he'll choose a benzo. Take that all away, he'll choose another downer. Take that all away, he'll choose an upper. Take that all away, got it? He doesn't leave the table <laughs> until the drugs are gone. His problem is addiction to drugs. Alcohol happens to be one of them. So, um, and marijuana is not addiction? Yes, it is. Of course it is. Uh, it, it's a little different from other uh, drugs in, in a couple of senses. One, first of all, tolerance for marijuana does develop. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, if you smoke more, you need less. <laughs> that's what we clinically refer to as bullshit. Yeah. All right, that's, that's what that is. Now, if you smoke more, you need more. It's just now you're smoking a more potent pot than was available to you 15 years ago. So it's upped its THC uh, content, but you're, you're, you have to smoke more to get the, the we out of it. Um, people lose control of its use, but they don't lose control in the sense that, see, with alcohol and heroin and cocaine, the loss of control is more obvious in, in these terms, that if you start there seems to be a more, 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 more phenomenon. So, you ever see people chain smoke cigarette? It's loss of control. They light one up and it just keeps going, all right? Cocaine, people who snort cocaine, snort it, they feel high for 20 minutes, the high dissipates and they have to snort it again. And they'll snort a whole half ounce <laughs> of cocaine in an evening. That's a hell of a dose, all right? Heroin addicts, they inject, four hours later they're down and they have to inject again. So you have that chain use. With marijuana it more often happens another way, it more often happens this way. It's not a, a chain triggered by the first dose, it's the inability to stay away from the first dose. Say, <laughs> so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop altogether. I'm not going to ever smoke a joint never, ever again in my life. Uh, about um, two days later, uh, you hear this call uh, <laughs> from your bedroom closet. Mary Jane, I'm here, <laughs> ready to go. Come on, you want to feel good? Smoke me, right? Smoke me. Kind of like nicotine addiction, isn't it? Is that you can stop, but then out of the blue, for no apparent reason, and it's not because of stress, nicotine says what? Smoke. Smoke, smoke, smoke. Pick that goddamn cigarette out of that ashtray and light the end of it. Smoke, 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 smoke. You say, God damn it, go away, and it doesn't go away. Then it goes away. You say, oh, thank God that's over. And then it says, smoke, <laughs> smoke, smoke, smoke. They're pulses. They're like pulses. So, yeah, marijuana is an addictive drug, and people persist in using it uh, until they lose, you know, pretty much everything. They've smoked away their lives. They don't punch policemen very often. Alcoholics do that. We reserve that for alcoholics. They can punch the cops. At marijuana smokers, they don't punch anything, as a matter of fact. <laughs> they don't even punch an idea, for Christ's sake, much less a cop. Here's another myth. Drugs are evil. Drugs aren't evil. They can't be. They can't think. So the notion that you can protect your children by telling them that a drug is evil is simply going to mislead them. You can't tell a kid a lie on Tuesday and have him believe you on Wednesday, all right? Drugs can't think. I don't care if their names are Molly and Mary Jane, they can't think. In order to be evil, you have to be capable of will and intention, right? You have to be capable. Of that, and they can't do that. Yeah, I know you want to protect your kids against starting. I know that. Uh, and it's a noble motive, and it's an understandable mo motive, and it can be scary as hell if they do. But you can't tell them a lie on Tuesday and have them believe you on Wednesday. All right?
right? They're not evil. Anyone who uses drugs becomes addicted to them. Uh, that's another fabrication. Uh, how many of you know someone who drank heavily in college and then within five years after college matured out? In other words, was no longer drinking heavily. How many of you know such people? It happens. It happens. There are some people that if you look at them in college, you would think, oh my God, they're alcoholics. And you look at them five years later and they're not. And there are studies that sort of demonstrate that with, with hard data. So some people just mature out. So starting with a drug doesn't necessarily mean becoming addicted to, uh, to that drug. Uh, hell, if everyone that you knew in college who smoked pot went on to become a heroin addict, how many heroin addicts would you know? <laughs> Tons! How many do you know? I'll just In fact, I don't know any. I don't know any. But I knew a lot of guys who smoked, it in co smoked pot in college. So that notion is, again, an attempt for parents to, con to, to kind of frighten their kids from starting. Uh, but it's not true. And they know it. They know it. So those are the myths. Now, what is addiction? Here's the answer. We don't know. You don't know. You would talk about this for two hours and you don't know what it is. That's right. You know, my friends will tell you I can talk two hours about anything, all right? But I can, I can talk about marijuana for two hours, alcohol and addictive drugs and addiction for two hours without knowing essentially what it is. I can tell you these things about it. It's sort of just like a magnetic field. If you go ask a physicist this question, what is a magnetic field? He will say to you, I don't know. But I can tell you these things about it, all right? I can give you a descriptive definition, not an essential definition, all right? So here's what I'll tell you. I'll tell you, first of all, it exists. How do I know that? It does stuff. Like what kind of stuff? It'll pick nails out of a box, okay? It does stuff. Um, Next thing I can tell you about this magnetic field stuff is that it's powerful. I will now demonstrate it lifting a truck right off the ground. Psh, trucks lift. What is that? Damn if I know, but it's what it does, all right? That's how powerful it is. It is predictable. I will take this magnet. I will hold it over um, railroad spike. It will cause the railroad spike to jump out of the box if it's powerful enough. I will take the same magnet and put it in a box of brass tacks who won't touch them. It will not attract brass. And finally, I can put a piece of paper over a magnet and I can put iron shavings over that and that's the, the image that you will see. Wow, what is that? That's a magnetic field. What's a magnetic field? Damn if I know, but that's what it looks like. So that's basically what we're going to do with addiction. I'm going to tell you it exists. How do I know? It does stuff. Like what kind of stuff? Leads lives. That's one thing it does. It makes life choices. Uh, number two, I can tell you that it is powerful. Uh, well, how do you know that? I said, well, I've seen, seen addicts given a choice uh, between... Um, living and, uh, and dying. And they've chosen to keep on smoking. Right? Would you agree that the will to live is a powerful will? Addiction can beat it. Addiction can beat it. Take a, a, a drug as, quote, simple. It's not simple at all. As apparently innocuous as nicotine. Guy goes to the doctor. Doctor says you have early stage emphysema, you'll have lung cancer within six months, and you'll probably not survive a year. On the way home, the patient purchases a carton of cigarettes. A carton of cigarettes. So this is pretty powerful. It is um, predictable. I used to tell patients, haven't the faintest idea of what will happen to you and what you will do if you get sober, but I know sure as hell what's going to happen to you if you don't. It's a very predictable progression. 
It's a predictable disease. And I'll tell you, from here on, these are some of the things that are going to happen to you. And then finally, we can show you what it looks like. We can, we can describe addiction if we can't define it. Okay? And basically, that's what we're going to try to do tonight. So, well, which drugs are abusable? Well, you can abuse any drug on the face of the earth if you want to, all right? Uh, you can abuse aspirin if you want to. Take too many of them. Do people generally take a lot of aspirin? No, why? Because it's not a party. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't make you feel, hmm, the, the abusable drugs are going to be. You can abuse uh, diuretics. You know what diuretics are? Those are the pills that you take to eliminate water. And I, my old joke was, but very few people abuse diuretics because not many people enjoy peeing a lot. Until a psychiatrist friend of mine, uh, whom I taught addiction to, said to me, wait a minute, you violate your own rule. The diuretic may not be high on the list of addictable drugs, but consider their potential in anorexics, bulimics, and high school wrestlers who want to make weight. So it's not always the potency of the drug, but the nature of the drugger <laughs> that counts. Um, now I say antihypertensives, blood pressure medicine, because you very few people say, wow, you should have seen what I did to my diastolic yesterday. <laughs> Doesn't happen. It's the psychoactive drugs, the mood-altering drugs that are m most abused. And an abusable drug with tolerance becomes an addictable drug, and all these drugs uh, develop tolerance. So all mood-altering drugs we're going to talk about tonight are pretty much the same thing. I mean, we, we talk about alcohol. I was trained in alcohol, uh, but an alcoholic and a drug addict are the same creature. It doesn't matter what drug he's using. Most of these drugs play with the dopamine system. They rob the dopamine system of its ability to produce dopamine. So um, they're, all, uh, they're all abusable. Uh, because tolerance does develop for, for all of them. Now, um, they come in these categories. Downers, uppers, mind movies, and anything else that won't fit in those three categories. Where does marijuana belong? Technically, chemically speaking, uh, marijuana is a, an hallucinogen. Okay? Uh, you know how you can tell that? The rule of thumb, the three letters of the alphabet describe its psychoactive properties, then it's usually an hallucinogen. So what's the granddaddy hallucinogen of them all? Came out in the, it was long before the 60s, but we started to hear about it in the 60s. And if you watched The Grateful Dead, you couldn't miss it. Right? LSD, TCP, and TH. See. Well, I don't feel, I don't hallucinate on marijuana. It's because you haven't had it in potent enough dose. Uh, in a more potent dose, you'll start to see um, the music sound much different than it used to sound. But we're talking about hashish and hash oil now. If you define a drug chemically, marijuana is an hallucinogen. If you f define it in terms of its perceived effect, what do people think it makes them feel, you'll call it a depressant. So we call marijuana other. <laughs> other. Because if you say one, people think you're nuts. You say the other, and they say, I've never hallucinated. Uh, and then there are um, combination drugs. In the old days, we could tell you what ecstasy was, because we knew it was fairly well regulated even on the, on the market, and it was a combination of hallucinogen and stimulant. In fact, when I first heard of uh, ecstasy, um, I said, oh, that's, that's LSD. They're talking about acid. I said, no, it's something different, Dick. It's, they're, they're, I said, they're talking about it in the same way they were talking about acid in the six, 70s, all right? I said, no, this is, this is something different. Now, on the street today, if you buy something called molly, nobody can promise you what the hell's in that. <laughs> that drug that you've just purchased, because the potency or what it's combined with, not always pre terribly predictable. So you have these categories. Uh, simplified, 
downers, uppers, hallucinogens, and combinations, and others. The DSM-5 recognizes these categories. Interestingly, now, tobacco is on the list. Okay? But you notice that they're still some of the same old favorites. Alcohol is a, a depressant. Caffeine's a stimulant. Uh, cannabis, it all depends, other. Hallucinogens are hallucinogens. Inhalants are depressants and sometimes uh, mixed with all kind of shit. Opioids are depressants, and et cetera. So the simple uppers, downers, mind movies, and others. So there are the depressants. And the list of depressants is going to include alcohol, uh, barbiturates, nembutol, two and all. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Persh used to say anything at all. If it ends in an all or at all, it's, an, it's probably a barbiturate. Benzos, Valium, Librium, Cerax, Transine, Clonopin, et cetera. The narcotics are heroin, morphine, uh, the law that sedatives. Um, there are a bunch of sedatives not as popular as the barbiturates. So alcohol comes in lots of different flavors and lots of different potencies. Uh, barbiturates um, uh, come in different flavors as well, more and less potent. A longer lasting or shorter lasting, a slow onset or fast onset. The benzos, uh, rohypnol, uh, you recognize as the date rape drug. That's rohypnol or rubies. The narcotics are codeine and morphine and tolwin and methadone. Um, new one on the list is suboxone. Uh, suboxone probably going to replace methadone in this country at some point. Um, it seems less troublesome. And it's available in a doctor's office, so you don't have to uh, stand outside a meth clinic with the other addicts and get sold. Demerol, I had a physician patient who sat on his bed cross-legged. He had been injecting Demerol for a long time. He looked at me, I'll never forget it, and he said, give me Demerol. I looked at the nurse who was with him, I said, shit, get him some Demerol. <laughs> he was intense, he was intense. Um, oxycodone, that's a kid's version, Percodone. Other sedatives, the ones that I didn't mention are Quaaludes and chloral hydrate and placidil, et cetera, a little weaker than the benzos. The stimulants end in ene or adrene, methamphetamine. Meth is a terrible drug. You heard last week, you saw the faces of meth. If you didn't, come back <laughs> for week six. Uh, dexedrine, Ritalin, the ADD medication. Okay, that has potential for addiction. Ionomin, silide, Adderall is another ADD med. Nicotine is a stimulant, caffeine, cocaine, and, and crack. And then you have the hallucinogens, lysergic acid, diethylamide 25. Initially proposed as um, a schizophrenic mimetic. In other words, there were researchers uh, who were saying to themselves, this produces symptoms that are like schizophrenia. You hallucinate. You see shit that ain't there. Numbers talk and, and um, music walks. They're kind of crazy shit. I had a kid who, uh, the flowers sang, okay? The flowers breathed. Um, and so they were going to try to see whether they could develop an antipsychotic drug that would rapidly reverse those symptoms. So can we come up with a drug, Stelazine, Thorazine were the popular ones. We're going way back now. Uh, were the popular ones then, so that we'd get the patient on LSD and then we'd hit him with some stelazine and see how quickly we could stop the hallucinations. So when it was thought of first, it was thought of uh, as this imitates a very serious issue, which is schizophrenia. Okay. Uh, salvia is a new short-acting hallucinogen. And if you look that up online and, you know, Google... Uh, salvia intoxication, you'll see some strange damn stories. Cannabis, 
THC, marijuana, sensimedia, hashish, hashol, get more and more potent as you go down the list. Okay? And different forms. Smokable, uh, this is almost a tar-like substance. And then others. NyQuil, alcohol-based. Nitrous oxide is an inhalant downer. It's a laughing gas. Dennis gives it to me. Tylenol-3 is Tylenol with codeine. Uh, mouthwash is sometimes uh, 26 proof, all right? Or I mean 52 proof, tw twice the amount of alcohol. Listerine is virtually, in some, some Listerine is 50 proof. We, um, I went to a nursing home where a woman was staying and she was um, there because she had gotten sick and we knew she was an alcoholic and uh, she had a bottle of Listerine on her nightstand, so I asked her, are you drinking? And she said, no. And um, the Listerine was half empty. And I said to her, are you drinking that? And she said, yes. And I said, well, that's alcohol. Didn't you know that? And now I'm going to quote her. She said, what the fuck do you think I'm drinking it for, dearie? <laughs> I'm not drinking, but that doesn't count. <laughs> So it's alcohol, all right? Uh, those are exact words. On the end of that story is they, they found her dead in her apartment. Listerine bottles all over the place. Bath salts. Uh, it's similar to methyl, dimethyl, etc. It's meth. K2 spice is a synthetic marijuana. Man-made marijuana. Aerosols, inhalants found around the house. You uh, you probably have a bunch of them in your medicine cabinet and underneath your sink. And they're very popular with middle school addicts. Okay. Um, ecstasy, which is now called Molly. Uh, you know, Molly is not a cute girl from uh, New York. She's a potent um, MDMA. And ice, which is a street name for methamphetamine in smokable form. Now, what are the drugs with the highest potential uh, for abuse? Because we know that not all drugs um, hit you as quickly, uh, leave you as, as fast. Uh, and so I've come up with this way of thinking about these kinds of drugs. So the first question I ask is, whenever I hear about some new drug, is um, how, how fast does it hit you? How quickly will you feel the drug, okay? Um, that depends on two factors. One is the drug and two is how you, uh, how you get it into your system. If you inject a drug, you put it right into your bloodstream, you feel it almost immediately, okay? That's why a heroin addict will inject his heroin and be out before he's gotten the needle out of his arm, okay? He's gone before the needle's even out of his arm. In fact, some inject it and die before the needle's out. Okay? Because they were injecting China White, which 10 years ago was a particularly potent thing that uh, hit the streets. And we were, they were finding addicts uh, dead. When heroin addicts, who are big time heroin addicts and really into it, strong in denial, when they heard that someone had overdosed, you know what they asked, don't you? Where'd they get it? Where the hell did they get that stuff? I gotta get some of that. Got it? Boy, if it killed Harry, this must have been good shit. All right? If it killed Harry. You talk about the insanity of addiction, that's part of what it's about. So it hits you quick, all right? You don't have to wait around. Alcohol, you, you drink alcohol, what, what do you feel it? Within, what, 20 minutes or so, half hour? Snort cocaine, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. How high does it take you? The drug that takes you way up here is going to be more desirable than one that just takes you here. I mean, that's the whole principle, the old principle of methadone maintenance. Heroin right. takes you this high and lasts four hours. Methadone takes you this high and last 24 hours. So to get, to stay high on heroin, what do you have to do? Redose every four hours. Means break the law every four hours, unless you have a big supply, OK? 
okay? With methadone, you're not even half as high. When you're up here on heroin, you're what they call on the nod. You're not educable. You're shit-faced. You're out of it. You love it. If you're on methadone, we can at least educate you, and we got 24 hours in which to do it. Suboxone is now, I think, going to take the place of methadone. It already is creeping into mainstream treatment. Okay? It's happening in mainstream treatment. Not every addict, not, you know, one size fits all. There are some addicts who need different treatment. The desirable treatment is obviously abstinence, but some people can't do that right away. They need to be slowly detoxed, gradually detoxed. The aim is detoxification, abstinence, but how you get there is another, another question. Okay? Uh, the problem with methadone is that people were on it for 20 years. They never did detox from it. So it wasn't, it wasn't a medication that was used to... Um, slow, used as slow detox, it was methadone <coughs> maintenance. <laughs> leaves you fast. If a drug leaves you fast, it does two things. It creates the illusion of safety, first of all, right? Look, I was only, uh, cocaine. Feel it in 20 seconds, trip lasts 20 minutes. Shit, no problem, right? I'm back down after 20 minutes, all right? Now, unfortunately, I also have to redose again because it was only a 20-minute trip. So we start snorting it and snorting it and snorting it and snorting it. The end of the evening, you're out of stimulant, uh, and you've crashed, and there's no more cocaine. So the faster it leaves you, it's going to create the illusion of safety, but it's also going to require redosing more frequently. Uh, next, it's perceived as safe, not is safe, that they think it's safe. Okay, uh, for a long time that's what they thought about crack, and then they started finding people dead on crack. So they decided, well, dead is not safe, so we better not keep calling that safe. All right, dead is dead safe? No, 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 dead's not safe. And some drugs produce more significant cravings than others, don't they? There are plenty of alcoholics who who have only mild cravings for alcohol. Compare those cravings to nicotine cravings. Nicotine cravings are sometimes far more powerful than an alcohol craving will be. Crack, Jesus, you don't want to have crack cravings. It drive you nuts. All right, so it, it's a pretty intense craving. Y you hear addicts talk about it all the time. So here's what we're going to do tonight is, where do you draw the line? How is, uh, how is use defined? At what point do we say it's no longer use? That would be an instance of abuse. Uh, when will we call you uh, not just an instance of abuse, but a, an abuser? Uh, and when does abuse cross the line uh, to addiction? We'll throw in two other um, uh, categories. One is reliance. I'll try to define that for you. And the other, of course, is dependence, which I've already defined for you. Okay? There are two kinds of drugs. There are those that we call social and recreational. Um, and depending on where you go in the world, different drugs will be classified as such, right? Which drugs in the United States are called social or recreational. There are actually three. Two are stimulants and one is a depressant. So the depressant is alcohol and the stimulants are caffeine and, and nicotine. So they are largely social, acceptably social and recreational. Does that change though? What's happened to nicotine in the past 15 years. Is it a social, recreational drug in the United States? It really is changing its color in this country, right? If you're going to smoke it, not in my bus, or my airplane, or my restaurant. So that's, that can change, that can change. 
uh, people tell me, well, Dick, you're never, go you're never going to change society's uh, perception uh, of alcohol. And I say, well, we've done it with one drug already, haven't we? In fact, we've done it with two drugs. And they went in opposite directions. One's nicotine, right? We made that mm, smelly. And the other's marijuana. We're talking about legalizing that one. So a society can change. The question is, does it want to? So there are social and recreational drugs. Those three things shift. Um, is, is marijuana a social or recreational drug in the United States? Now you ask that to any audience and you're going to get two answers. How many say yes, it is a social and recreational drug in the United States? How many of you say no, it's not a social or recreational drug in the United States? Got it? So we're in the fight right now. I was in a store today that has selling t-shirts that said legalize marijuana. Okay? They don't advertise if they will. I know they'll attract some customers and uh, lose others, all right, if that's, that's the way they're going to do that. Um, some people say it, yes, and some people, how many of you think PCP is a social recreational drug? Fencyclidine, horse tranquilizer. <laughs> that, that's what they call it, a horse tranquilizer. And do we want to, that's where I was headed, do we want a zero tolerance? We want no one to be at risk for premature sickness and early death from drugs. Zero tolerance for drugs. Can we Americans maintain that position as things stand today? No. Why? We already uh, accept from 8 to 15 percent of our population at the, this very moment is at risk for problems, life, terrible life consequences, uh, brain damage, and early death. What's the drug? Alcohol. Alcohol is the drug. So we already accept an 8 to 15 percent risk population. So we can't say, can't do it. Now there's one group who's decided they don't want anybody at risk. Guess who they are? Native Americans. Because their, their proneness is so high, they're afraid they're going to kill themselves off. That Jim Beam's going to kill uh, all the Sioux and the Navajo and the etc. They're afraid they're going to die off. Their young, guy, their young men get it. They get it quick. They get it hard. They get it fast. And they die young and don't get married, don't have little Sioux. So they're afraid that they're going to disappear if they keep it up. So they criminalized alcohol on the reservation. Unfortunately, they couldn't do a thing about what off the reservation. So where do young <laughs> Navajo go? <laughs> they go right off the reservation. I would define it as social use if it's social and sociable. Uh, you, your, your behavior is socially acceptable and you do it in social situations. If you're drinking alone in your basement while watching the Ravens game, that's not social drinking. Why? Because it's not in a social situation. Oh, you mean my father's an abuser? No. I just mean that's not social use. Well, you're telling me who my father is. No, I'm describing what he's doing that day. All right, that's all. I'm not, I, don't, I don't claim to know his personality. All right? Uh, but if it's not social in social situations, then you can't say what it is. You can only say what it's not. <laughs> okay? That's all. And they'll keep pushing you. Well, are you saying this? No. Are you saying this? No. All I'm saying is that's not social use. What your father did is not social use. That's all. That's all. It's social and sociable in modest amounts. Acute intoxication is not common. It's not the problem. It's not, not in a pattern. And here's key. No harm. No matter how much or how little, where, when, why, or how, if harm occurs, it crosses a line. It's more than simply not social use. It's something else. Okay? So what you need is, in other words, I would call you a social user if characteristically your drinking is social and sociable. Other people around, the object is for you to interact. 
The object isn't, for, isn't to figure out who can get shit-faced quickest, all right? So if you're a kid and the aim of the party is who can get schnockered best, fastest, that isn't social, all right? That's a game, all right? That's a contest. In modest amounts, in other words, you don't throw up and fall down, all right? You have a couple of drinks on a social occasion, uh, you say good night, you go to hell home, and you go to bed. You don't get home and open up a sex pack and drink that that night and smoke two joints and snort a line of coke and then have to come down with another drink. No, that, that's not a modest amount. Okay. And then finally, no harm results. If you are drinking and if you've had two drinks and you fall down the stairs because of them, then, it's, then harm has resulted. And I won't call that use. We'll call that something else. Okay. I'll call you a user if, these, if this starts to be a pattern. In other words, harm is, harm is caused regularly. There's a pattern of harm now. Then I'm going to call it something else. Okay? Take uh, less than 10 minutes, please. This is a long one. And I'll see you back in 10 minutes.